I mean, you can make people believe almost anything. You can. It's politics, baby. Anything is possible. We vote someone in. They do the opposite of what they said they're going to do. We don't like it. But then we reelect them. Why? It's all sales. Everything is sales. There are two things that drive campaigns. Money and people. Notice I didn't say message, because message comes afterwards. But you need money and people to get your message out there. The money to use social media and things like that. There's actually some theories out there from different campaigners that I've seen that you have to interact with a voter at least three different times before they actually are aware of who you are. Money in politics, it's the lifeblood. Government is looking to control as much as it can over as many people as it can all the time. The pandemic was an opportunity to do just that. Do you think an honest politician can actually succeed? So what I want to say is... The ways politicians manipulate the masses, you said there's a lot of strategies. Um, I mean, what you described was very similar to how an entrepreneur promotes their product. It's, it's, it's very similar. You put it out there in people's face because there's also rules that you have to put it in front of the person's face in order for them to be aware of you and your product. And the more you push it, the more, well, the more they'll buy. So in grocery stores, what you see is now products that are being pushed the most are the ones who are, well, who people buy the most. And you can have a very high quality product at a very cheap price, but it has no marketing. So it's just going to sit there. It's all sales. Everything is sales. Uh, you're selling your positions. You're selling yourself. Or if you're selling a product, it's all the same concept. Uh, the tactics that are used in politics is more about selling ideas, selling dreams, selling the person, than it is selling a product. A product you can is tangible. It's something that you can see, you, you can interact with, uh, you can inspect yourself on your own time. Politician, not so much. Uh, because, again, the politician tells you who they are. You can do some investigation... Uh, I know that political parties, at least the political parties around here, should do some vetting. They'll do like a credit search. They'll do a background search. Uh, sometimes they'll talk to friends and references to see if there's any deep, dark secrets out there that they need to know about before they endorse you. Um, there are ways of vetting a candidate. But as far as when they're out in the field, it's, you know, you have a logo. You have a website. You have a social media presence. You have something that you want to give someone. This time is, like I said, an idea, a dream, an aspiration, a concept. It sales. It really is just sales. Um, and there's a reason why they call going door to door and interacting with people retail politicking because you are doing retail sales with citizens. It's it's just pretty sad knowing that someone can have best intentions, but they just don't have. The campaign money so they can't be put in front of your face enough for you to actually vote for or them. Or they're not marketable enough. They could have the best intentions. They're not marketable, that's right. They can have the best of intentions. They can be absolutely brilliant people, but you put them in front of a camera and they're not appealing or they freeze up or you know maybe they're bad with people. You have brilliant, wonky people out there that know everything about every issue, that can talk to you about anything. But you put them in front of a group of 10 people and they, they just don't know what to do. So there is, don't discount the marketing, the marketability of people as well as being a reason why they run for office. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Starting therapy can be hard. The right therapist for you may not be in your area. BetterHelp is now sponsoring this podcast. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy session as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash captainese. Clicking that link helps you support this channel and it also gives you a 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Again, go to betterhelp.com slash 
Captainese. Clicking that link gives you 10% off your first month of therapy. There, there was one candidate in, in, uh, in the area of New York City. His name is Michael Grimm. On paper, the best candidate ever. Handsome guy, former Marine, was a current attorney, uh, just so telegenic, someone that every woman just fawned over. He got elected. He gets into office, he doesn't really do the right thing, and it turns out that he, uh, he didn't really have a brain in his head, so his staff did a lot of the work for him, but also he had a side business that nobody knew about where he was hiring illegal immigrants to do labor. And he got in trouble for that, he got arrested for that, and ultimately he left office on his own uh, because he made a deal with the government to avoid jail time. This is what you end up with when you deal with the sizzle and not the steak. You know, I mean, I, people would see it useless if we have a president who would make the best decisions and the best policies we've ever seen, but he would make them behind closed doors and we wouldn't, you know, and he wouldn't deliver speeches. I don't think we could deal with that. Well, I also think that's an unrealistic system, though, you know, because nobody will do anything good behind closed doors and you will not know about it because they'll, there are so many press people. There are so many uh, partisans in media that will tout this and be like, look what he did. Even though he's not saying it, we're going to say it for him. And now look how humble he or she is as well, because they haven't touted it. I mean, one of the things that came, I remember this during the 2016 campaign, one of Donald Trump's sons, Eric Trump, is on the board of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. But they weren't talking about it. But then all of a sudden, an article came out about how you know, the Trump family is very involved with St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And, oh, my God, there's so many good things that he does. And then all these stories would come out about, you know, Trump didn't talk about this himself, but he gave $10,000 to a maid who was working in his hotel because she really needed it or something like that. And, it all, and it's not him saying it. It's someone else saying it because he's too humble to say it himself, right? These are the games that are played. If, and that's why I said politics is a lot like team sports as well. Because you do have these teammates out there in media, in government, in uh, the public, in uh, you know the uh, special interest groups who write up all the legislation. My God, it's it's a it's a it's an amazing machine that has been created. I had a friend who was basically like a radio. Whatever you would tell him, it would spread. So I figured that out, and I. You know, I was strategic about what I tell him. So there were things that I wanted to brag about, but I didn't want to seem like I'm bragging. So I would just say to him, I knew it's going to be out and it's going to be even better because I kept it to myself. There's a strategy called a steel man strategy. Okay, so what you would do is, well, you're a lawyer. What you would do is you would take another person's perspective and you basically put yourself in the, in the role of their lawyer. So you're advocating for them. You put away the fact that you disagree with everything they just said, but you try to advocate what they think and you try to make the case for what they said. So it's a really good strategy for when you're arguing with someone. I imply it sometimes. It works like magic, you know. And, and I mean, and you can ask yourself, are we really that stupid that we need a strategy for arguing? But yes, we do because we don't know how to argue. I think, yeah, I, I think that would be a it would be a brilliant move, you know, but I guess it would just kill the dynamic of oppositions, which is something that we need, because if we have us versus them, then that sells more. You know, it's a it's a bigger viewership. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's definitely a bigger viewership. Presidential debates. Uh, one minute to answer is because you want to get through a wide number of topics. You actually get, there's actually normally three debates between the two candidates before the election. So you're looking at really six hours of discussion between the two of them. Uh, the reason they limit, they limit it to one minute is because they want to make sure they hit every single topic they can in that two-hour show or whatever. It really is just a show. How I would do debates, if I was a moderator in a, in a debate, here's how I would do it. Because I think that moderators oftentimes have agendas as well. I think that a moderator in a debate wants to make themselves sometimes the focus of attention and look at this great question I'm asking. I have this giant preamble and everything. So the way I would handle a debate is say, Candidate X, we are discussing the conflict between Israel and Hamas. You have two minutes. Go. 
And let's see what they come up with. If they hit the topic in a way that resonates with the voter, great. I want to see where their mind is. I don't want to frame a question. I'm going to say, the topic is the israel Hamas conflict. Go. Let's see what you got. You can also see where their mindset is, because if the first thing they do is they start talking about how the other candidate doesn't know how to deal with that, then you know what they're in there for. And you're not, and they can't, exactly, and they can't game the question. They can't say, well, I reject the premise of your question, and I'm going to talk about this anyway. They just get to talking about what they want to talk about. I don't want people gaming questions. The issue is out of control inflation in the country. Go. You know, things, things like, that's the way you hit the The issue is spending X amount of dollars on such and such. Go. Just give me, and if you don't hit the point, if you miss the mark on what people are thinking about that, you're screwed. But you screwed yourself. It wasn't a moderator that screwed you. That's the way I would handle a debate. It's also, uh, I think it's very fair to mention the fact that even if you have a strategy to fix a certain problem, if the strategy is not radical enough, people are not going to like it because nobody wants to hear your way of solving a problem if it's gradual and with steady steps. People don't want to hear that. We want to hear radical um, answers to questions that solve the problem immediately. A word about the fringes for just one second. Moderates don't change the world. People on the fringes do. And let's take an example. Let's take someone like an Elon Musk. His thinking about space exploration is not the same as the mainstream thought about space exploration. But he put his money where his mouth is and he's developed innovations where he can now retrieve rockets and have them land back where they started from. That's not something that NASA would have done because they're on the they're the mainstream and just trying to, to do their job. It took someone thinking on the fringes of what is possible to be able to develop what is now reality. When you talk about in politics, it was the fringes that have led to many, many atrocities in government. But it was also the fringes that led to the development of America. Let's be clear. The founding fathers of America were not in the mainstream of thought in Britain when it came to the colonies. They were the radicals of having their own representation in government. They were the radicals about having their own self-determination and all these high and mighty concepts that hadn't really been in place. They changed the world. So we shouldn't demonize the fringes. There are certainly fringe ideas that should be discarded as, you know, the wretched refuse of history that we've tried and just doesn't work. And we th think it's deplorable and all that. But those on the edges also drive innovation and development of society. So... They deserve their just due, and everything in life is about a balance. Can we balance those in the middle with those on the fringes and get somewhere where we're moving, not necessarily at the speed of light that the fringes may want us move at, but moving fast enough that we can keep everyone else in the mainstream just a little bit nervous about where things are going, but also hopeful about where things are going. Yeah, and it's also about the, well, here we go back to intention, right? What is the purpose of you proposing a radical idea? Is it to get views and to get trust of people and for people to love you? Or do you actually believe that this is worth trying, right? So it's all about the attention, which is really difficult to prove. And that's one of the biggest issues that we have. Mm, a lot of politicians also um, create policies for which there is a lot of umph now and a lot of instant gratification for them and a lot of excitement. But the results are going to show... Um, allegedly in eight years, which is very convenient for them because, you know, eight years is exactly the time where you don't have to uh, answer for whatever it is that, you know, that the, the, the result is going to be. Or let's say, okay, 10 years, because then the other guy is going to be in the office for two years and then you could kind of blame it on him. Uh, so that's strategic. But let's say we vote someone in. This is um, the case in my country. 
we vote someone in. They do the opposite of what they said they're going to do. We don't like it. But then we re-elect them. Why? Oh, because it's comfortable. Because it's easier to grin and bear it than it is to create change. The power of incumbency of office is very, very strong. Uh, let me give you an example locally here. So you elect someone in, in office, and let's say it's a local, like a state legislature or something like that. You will then get mail from them saying all the good things that they're doing. You don't really care about it, but you know they're keeping you updated. Hey, we built a park here. Hey, we, we brought back this money for this program here. Uh, these kids are getting this in this school here and all that. But maybe that's not what you intended them to vote for or anything like that, but they're letting you know what's going on. The power of a politician to self-perpetuate their power through efforts like that, newsletters or just awareness, social media posts, whatever it may be, gives them an air of authority. So when they have a challenger in the next election cycle, they can speak from a position of authority they didn't have before. And that, uh, speaking from authority impresses people. It's just human nature. People say you're an expert in something, they think that they should be listened to. It's one of the basis in our jurisprudence. We qualify people as experts, and therefore their opinion means something. Same thing with politicians. When they get into office, they know how things run. They know how the office should operate. They know how to get different deals from different people. They speak from authority. And they self-perpetuate their position, and it takes a really strong challenger or a really weak incumbent to get that person out of office. I use this story all the time. The last time... We, we've had many different governors in New York State. The last time a governor was voted out of office was in the 1990s. It was Mario Cuomo, the father of Andrew Cuomo, who was in office then. Everyone else since then has either left office on their own or left in disgrace or was... was and, and, and that's the way they've gotten out. And it's been like five governors in a row. And it's been over 30 years. Because people are too lazy to vote people out. They're comfortable in their lives. They're not going to vote someone out. It takes a great deal of agitation and aggravation in someone's life to get the average person politically motivated enough to take action. Uh, we've, we've seen many activists take action because of an issue. But to get the average person to vote someone out of office... It takes a lot. They have a lot of tolerance for a lot of bullshit before they actually take action to vote someone out. And on the last point I'll make, at least here in America, we're lazy. We are a lazy, satisfied, frivolous people. We don't really care about the text in a bill because the machine's just going to keep on churning anyway. And... You know, I got my brew, I got my big screen TV, I got my cable or satellite TV or whatever it is. My family's well fed. I'm chilling. I'm good. Let all those people in politics do whatever they want to do. It's not affecting my life. When it starts affecting their life, it's almost too late to act. So, that's a big reason as well. People are lazy and politicians are really good at perpetuating their own power. I mean, if people stay in abusive relationships because of the known compared to unknown why wouldn't they keep the politician that actually that reminded me of um a couple of years ago we had big news like big headlines saying that the what was what was it the the wage gap between men and women ranked and everyone was so happy about well because it was supposed to be the work of the government now people don't necessarily know how the average wage is calculated right and well they they didn't do the research because well if if well less women are were working back then and now more women are working so it's it's about the averages being calculated because if i have my head in the oven and my feet my feet in the freezer on the average i'm quite comfortable but so a lot of women didn't work and the average, well, it, it, it was like the sum of the salary divided with the number of workers, which is like a horrible way of doing statistics. And then they compared that to men. 
So now as more women entered the workforce, obviously the average increased. So, but nobody did the research. They just saw the headline and they were like, yay, government. <laughs> Fuck you. Anyway, <laughs> but especially this wage gap is such a simple calculation to do. There are things that many people take as face value because in order for you to to prove mistakes or flaws in the statistics, you would have to do a lot of things. But but this one is a low hanging fruit. And if people just take this at face value, you know, who knows? I mean, you can make people believe almost anything. You can. You know? It's it's all about the headline and about the emotions. And that's kind of the point of the book. Take nothing at face value. Do as best you can your own research. Get your own fact. Gather your facts together. Come to your own conclusion. Don't let anybody else come to the conclusion for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, who has a better campaign, Biden or Trump? In 2024 or in 2020? 2020. In 2020... I believe that each campaign played to the strengths of their candidate. The Trump campaign had a brilliant statistical wing to it where they would be able to calculate down to the voter what they would do. So on the on the general level, had a great campaign. On the ground, had a shitty campaign because they thought that they could do everything centrally planned, basically, and didn't need the boots on the ground. So when things go wrong with voting in Pennsylvania, or things go wrong with voting in Arizona, there were no people on the ground to immediately act, to get into court, to file that order to show cause, or whatever. The Biden campaign played to their strength, which was let Donald Trump talk and keep my guy hidden as long as possible. Especially during COVID, when everybody else was hiding. So... They knew that they had a weak candidate in presenting arguments. They knew that they had a weak candidate in, in speaking. So they didn't have him speak as much. So they each played to their own strength. And depending upon your view as to how the election turned out, which campaign did better, I leave up to you. Uh, Trump got more votes than he did in 2016. So you can consider that a little bit of a success, even though he lost. And the Biden vote was really the anti-Trump vote. And they relied on that, and they played into that, and that allowed them to win. They didn't win because Biden was better. They won because Biden was less at less in sight, and Trump was hated by a lot of people. But that's a campaign strategy. You can't, you can't knock them for it. They did a great job in doing it. So, I mean, there were pluses on both sides. Obviously, who had the better campaign is the one who won. But you can point out strong suits on both sides. This year... Trump's kind of adopted the Biden strategy for the primary. He's not showing up anywhere. He's not doing anything. He's not interacting with them. So, and he's winning by leaps and bounds. He's miles ahead of everyone else. So, we'll see what happens in the general. We'll see if the tactics change. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Besides, like, the current situation really impacts on the things we remember. Because if the current guy did some bad things, then subconsciously we will remember positive things Trump did more than the negatives of what he did. So it's definitely a good strategy well, for think, him. Well, yeah. think about this yeah, right now. Yeah. The main line that I've seen for the past three and a half years online is, man, I could really go for some lower gas prices and mean tweets. You know, so... People remember, oh yeah, he was he's a he was a mean guy, he was an asshole. But I was paying two bucks a gallon. I wasn't paying, you know, I, I think up here I, I saw I saw it as high up here as like three sixty in my area. It's been other areas of the country are much higher. Uh but I mean now they're down around like two eighty seven. But um yeah, when gas prices were like a dollar eighty eight when he left office, People are highlighting that all the time. Boy, I used to like buying a dozen eggs when there were mean tweets around. And, you know, boy, I had a full gas tank when mean tweets were around. And, wow, I didn't have this much inflation when, when he was around. Even though some could argue that Trump's spending kind of left this inflation bomb for everyone to deal with. You know, people don't like to talk about that, but it's definitely out there. It's politics, baby. Anything is possible. Right. 
Well, the golden nugget for my country is migration. So now you already see as the elections are approaching, you see politicians being more anti-immigration because the current like the current guy in the office is actually kind of pro-immigration and people don't like it. So they're going to be humping that golden nugget for a while, you know, because that's going to work. And it is going to work. It is going to work. I'm going to steal that yeah, phrase. Those are good strategies. I'm going to steal that phrase, humping the golden nugget. I like that. I'm I'm writing it down right now. Yeah, and each country each country has a different golden nugget to pump, you know? Here we have anti-immigration. You guys have gas prices. Um, I, uh, what else? Croatia probably has praising tourism as opposed to other... Well, a anyway, you know, yeah. Yeah, so you just have to find a golden nugget and then hump it enough. Uh, so, yeah. You say every election we get duped either unwittingly or willingly by a politician who often turns out to be just another political buffoon. What do you mean by a political buffoon? What's the definition of that? That's a pretty broad question for me because buffoons come in all shapes and sizes and they possess different traits uh, within their own personality, within their, within their, own, within their own psyche. Uh, it, it can be as innocuous as the person who is very overconfident when speaking, but they really know nothing of what they're talking about, or it could be those devious hypocrites out there that know exactly what they're doing, but choose to do the wrong thing for the people rather than, and choose instead to do what they want to do for their own personal aggrandizement, their own personal gratification, their own personal wealth, what have you. It's a very wide range. It can be the really, really funny politician. Uh, and I can give you tons of examples of those. Or the really, really devious politician. And again, I can give you a ton of examples of those as well. And everything in between as well. How would you define Trump? Politicians are more buffoonish because their buffoonery is on display for the world to see. When it comes to Trump, Trump would fall into the category. And I talk about it in the book. There's actually a little bit of a chapter devoted to him. Uh, he's definitely a narcissist. Think about all the things that he does with regards to crowd size. He talks about how big the crowds are at his events. He talked about the first thing he did when he was elected was uh, talking about the crowd size of his inauguration. He definitely has that arrogance. He puts his name on every building. How can you not say he's not a narcissist? But he's not as uh, he's not as a damaging buffoon as say someone who may be more humble. And does damage in different ways. Uh, you, you, I mean, think of someone like uh, Andrew Cuomo, who was a may, who was a governor in uh, the People's Republic of New York, as I like to call it. Uh, and he was going around being the, you know, he comes from a great lineage of a of a political family. Yet he did more damage during COVID, even though he's supposed to be a a, a good man and a humble man, than Trump did in four years in office. One could argue that. So. Uh, Trump is certainly a, a class of buffoon, just like we all are, uh, but his buffoonery is more innocuous, in my opinion, than a lot of the politicians out there who want to be taken seriously and want to be, be considered credible. Then, you know, so, so Trump isn't really that, that dangerous of a, of a buffoon, in my opinion. I think a lot of it is inflated uh, by political uh, uh, adversaries, but yeah, absolutely. Trump's a buffoon, too. I mean, there's politicians who tell lies every now and then, but Trump just tells lie after lie. Like, he's not even trying. He's he's telling lies that are readily proven to be lies. So you got to give him, like, you got to give him some, you know, you got to give him some props for that. I think that that's the reason why Trump is maybe less dangerous than some other politicians, because he's lying, but at least he's up front. That's why I think, you know, communism is more detrimental to fascism because fascists want to kill you, but at least you know they want to. No, with communism, like you think they actually want the best for you. So, <laughs> and you know, you said every one of us is a little bit of a buffoon. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's human nature is to manipulate. I mean, we start manipulating and deceiving, I would say, at the age of not even one, maybe six months. Up until six months, whenever you cry, you, you actually need something. You're either hungry or whatever. But then after six months, ah, this is where we start uh, suffering our intelligence. We also have this intrinsic need and expectation for people to not lie to us. You have some, well, you have some people saying, well, I, I don't care if, if someone lies to me. I don't like, I'm, I'm not surprised by people anymore. Yeah, but subconsciously, you do expect that because let's say you have three cavemen 
And one of them said, watch out, there's a bear behind the tree. And the other one started running. And then the second one wanted to make sure and analyze the situation. Well, only one of them got to pass on their genes, right? So um, why, though, are we as nations susceptible to manipulation from the politicians? Why do we always fall for the same trick? I'm not a doctor. Let me start off by saying that. And I, I tend to agree with you that we are people who learn that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? When we're young and you cry, you, you definitely get that attention. Same thing throughout life. If you're dealing with you know, your job, you're dealing with family, you're dealing with uh, bigger political issues, that's kind of the way things go. The, the people who are the loudest get the most attention. That said... The people who promise you the most also get the most attention. The people who placate your interest and your needs get the most attention. And I think that in general, and this may be a, a bigger point about human nature, people are eternally hopeful that they are going to succeed in the end. There is this uh, idea that, okay, things didn't go for me so well with this politician, I didn't get everything I wanted, but the next one's going to do what I want. Or the next one after that, and there's this eternal hope that, hey, this new guy who's selling me his, his, his stuff now is going to be the one that's going to do right by me. And I think that's why Trump is so appealable to so many people, because for a lot of people, he followed through on what he said he was going to do while in office. But I think the larger question of why we keep falling from buffoon after buffoon is because we're aspirational in nature that we, we think that we're eventually going to get there. And I, I firmly believe that we will eventually someday once people get their act together. But the way that you get there is not by buying the bullshit from someone. It's by trusting and verifying the bullshit. Find out who the person is, see if they actually deliver in life, see their track record, their personal performance, and really become a discerning person. The way that you overcome people lying to you or any other hypocritical behavior is by you yourself taking personal responsibility and being more discerning when judging someone who's going to have such an impact on your life. People don't take their vote seriously nowadays, especially here in the United States. They, because we are, we're victims of our own success in a way, in that we live very comfortable lives, we have too many things and gadgets and, and too many distractions in our life that we can let it slide that someone is uh, kind of coming to office, and yeah, they're going to do some things that are bad, and they're going to do some things that are good, and we're going to end up being okay in the end because the machine just keeps on turning. Well, we got to stop looking at it that way and start looking at, well, the machine may be turning, but it's not turning at peak efficiency. Maybe we start becoming more discerning in who we put into office, and we'll let less of those people in, and maybe things will get a little bit better, and all those aspirations will start becoming more of a reality. I mean, there's also something to say about the fact that it's just a lot simpler to just complain all the time. And I've said that before in, well, this generation, we gladly uh, exchange integrity and responsibility for victimhood. And also, there's something to say about the fact that it's actually really time consuming to do a research. It, it, it takes a lot of effort. And, uh, and people avoid talking politics altogether, which, by the way, I think it's, it's, it's very irresponsible of people to not be interested in politics. And a lot of times, especially young people, they seem to be proud to avoid politics discussion. And I'm thinking, how can you avoid such an important topic? Like it's, it's following you on a daily. Does it not, um, affect how much money you make, how much money you you, you make after taxes, wh which laws you have to obey. I think not discussing politics is, is, I mean, it's one thing to not be interested in politics, but I think a certain level of analysis on your part is, I, I think it, sh it should be fundamental, honestly. I was like, like if, if it was up to me, I would make it an obligation for each voter to at least know what the program of the candidate is about. Um, maybe that's a radical statement, but I think that it's, it's just an obligation, honestly. Um, and by the way, there are webinars out there for people entering politics then that train them how to win elections. One of them is on YouTube, actually. I, I think it's led by Jay Townsend. Uh, he has a, he has like a playlist and these strategies usually 
include like they're a mixture of using social media and talking in stories instead of just events themselves because yeah i've known jay for many many years he's a great guy he knows his stuff even it in court the case i mean it's about who can tell a better story right so uh it's uh so it's a very good strategy just talking in stories do you have any insights into um strategic manipulations of politicians especially how to use social media to manipulate the masses there's a well i mean you could do a whole show just on that uh, i just want to go back to one thing that you were talking about with um young people being more engaged in politics and the necessity of being engaged in politics just really quickly um government has made it that it is a necessity to be involved in politics because they become so intrusive in your life that you have to start paying attention. Uh, and I, maybe that's just a conservative in me coming out, but I think that because government becomes more and more intrusive into, uh, you know, what you eat, what you drink, and things of that, that nature, to the point of intrusiveness, there's a certain point where I think it goes over the line. Like we, we had a, a mayor in New York City wanting to ban sugary drinks for, cert, for uh, certain people back in the day, and the court struck that down as being too overreaching there are tons of examples of things like that there was a, ma- a governor in new mexico that said yeah the constitution guarantees they can carry a firearm but i'm making a law now that's saying that you can't and that ended up getting overturned and modified and and things like that so government becomes a lot more intrusive that you have to start paying attention to that now back to your original question of the use of money and, and i guess uh, social media to to manipulate voters when you run a campaign and I've run a couple of campaigns, a couple of successful ones as well. There are two things that drive campaigns. Money and people. Note that I didn't say message, because message comes afterwards. Uh, the, the, per, the candidate is who the candidate is. But you need money and people to get your message out there. The money to use social media and things like that. And the people to be out there in the streets with the signs and, and you know talking to other people and creating a buzz. Social media is good for that as well. I'm a little more old school when it comes to campaigning because I deal in a lot more local campaigns than I have in national campaigns. It's two different games. On the local campaigns, it is about reaching as many people as possible through the mail, through uh, phone banking, and uh, through just even getting out to different local events and meeting people, getting your name out there. You have to touch... There's actually some some theories out there from different campaigners that I've seen that you have to interact with a voter at least three different times doesn't matter how many ways, but three different times before Election Day, before they actually are aware of who, of who you are. Uh, so a mail, a phone bank, even though they're annoying, those robocalls are annoying as hell, but they, they are effective, believe it or not. And personal interaction are very helpful. And you can only do those things if you can pay for them. So you need that donor base as well to be able to get that message amplified and, and out into whatever your district size is. When it comes to... The national level, and you know, I haven't really worked on many national campaigns at that high a level to know all this, but I've seen that your message is all about the virality of your campaign, getting it out there to as many people as, as often as possible. We've seen Vivek Ramaswamy do that with media. We've seen Trump do that with social media and, and different postings. Uh, we've seen it uh, with uh, videos that people put out. Every campaign and every candidate now has a youtube channel this was not the way things were done many many years ago because the amplification of the message was about getting on tv and getting on radio and other mass media and the new opportunities of creating these videos means that money is going to explode as well you have to buy the equipment you have to get people online to do these things and we've seen this explosion of not only the 24-7 news cycle messaging, but the money out there. So these things have become necessities for amplification of message. As far as what the message is and the manipulation of it and what the positions are, man, you got an hour? I mean, we can just talk about uh, the different methods that people use, but really it comes down to what the candidate has to say and sort of their reason for being, right? So if you remember Joe Biden, he said his reason for being was the uh, Charlottesville uh, protests, and that was the reason why he got into office. I don't believe it for a minute, but that's what got his people rallied to to vote. That's what got him started. Uh, Trump's reason for being, if you remember back in 2016, 
is that he was worried about, you know, China, and he was worried about the Mexican border, and they build a wall, and that was his first message. That is what rallied his people. So whatever resonates is what they're going to go with. And, and you know, like you rightly said, money in politics is, is it's the lifeblood. But it's also the drug as well. Well, it depends on the state that the country, that the nation is in, because if people are fearful, then they're going to be a lot more susceptible to conservative beliefs. Is that not the case? I mean, this is why this is why it was a lot very well, easy for Hitler to to get the lead, because, well, because there was crisis everywhere. And I think that when when there's blood on the streets or 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 a pandemic, <laughs> it's uh, a lot. Well, it's a lot easier to convince people to become assertive. Well, let's also remember that uh, Hitler was a national socialist. We're gonna let's start off with with that first of all. I think that both sides are susceptible to the trappings of power. I think old school conservatives back in the day, and, and many of them are still in office today. If you look at all the dinosaurs that are still in office here in in the United States, they fundamentally started believing in government leaving people alone. Leave me alone, let me live my life, you live your life, and, and that's it. But we slowly developed into a country where there are laws governing so much of our social behavior and so much of our social constructs that it's impossible for government to leave you alone. When it came to the pandemic, it's amazing how the power of government turned two weeks to stop the spread to two years. And that was across different parties as well. So, you know, it was the, the Trump administration starting that message. It was the Biden administration turning that message much more loud in amplification when it came to different uh, jabs that you had to get and, and things like that. So I would say that both sides have the trappings of uh, dictatorial behavior or, or, you know, totalitarian behavior. They It can be that way if left unchecked, which is why... I'm lucky living in a country where we have sort of a self-checking system where ordinary citizens can challenge the constitutionality of laws and actions, that we're able to initiate government processes through the court system that can reach its way all the way up to the Supreme Court and be dealt with on that high of a level, that we do have these checks and balances here. Um, but your, your point is well taken, that government has become so big that they're looking to really... take. Government is looking to control as much as it can over as many people as it can all the time. The pandemic was an opportunity to do ju just that. Well, we took China as an example and we kind of implemented some of the policies that shouldn't be implemented. Maybe this is the first time some of these leaders actually found out how good it tastes to uh, control uh, your citizens. That was the first time that they got the taste of what is it like to have that type of control, and they were like, hmm, that's not so bad. I mean, that feels pretty good. What, what's the old saying? Uh, power uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I, I think a lot of people, a lot of our friends in Australia got a really, really bad taste of that, uh, which stories about being locked up in, in different camps during the pandemic. Uh, it thankfully didn't get that bad here in the United States, but it got bad all over. And yeah, people in power got a taste of more absolute power and it has that corrupting effect. Do you think it's in their interest to uh, polarize the nation? Because especially in the last few years, I hear people say Americans are as polarized as ever. I don't know if it's true. What's your take? Listen, this is a country that fought a civil war. So if you want to talk about the most polarizing times, I would probably say it was back then rather than now. Um, but it's, it's getting there. I mean, we haven't really, we, we're not seeing states take up arms against each other. We are seeing states, you know, bus illegal immigrants across state borders, and that's causing a little bit of a problem. Um, but I don't think it's the most polarizing time. It certainly is a polarizing time. And uh, that allows for the fringes of both sides to get more of a voice and try to move policy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a little, I think, Healthy governments go through times of tumultuous change, maybe not to the point of, you know, civil war and things like that, but if you go through a little bit of uncomfortable feeling, I think that's healthy now and then because that helps you reevaluate your position. I'm a firm believer in iron sharpens iron. 
I think there are good ideas on both sides of the aisle that if that need to get out there more and get out from the screaming of the fringes. Uh, so I think that, yes, this is a time of, I wouldn't say great conflict, but definitely tense conversations that need to be confronted. And I think once we get through those conversations, we come out stronger on the other side. Yeah, but I don't think we'll ever go through the conversations. I think uh, what's the best for everyone is to politics to just be like an open marketplace of ideas. It's It should be kind of like a buffet. Everyone adds their own thing, and then we somehow come up with a solution that we all don't disagree with too much. <laughs> I think if you know that your opinion is just that, then things are not going to escalate. I think the problem is that we have different realities, and we confuse the two. Your opinion is not a reality. So, so this knowledge actually made me more articulate when discussing problems with people because I became conscious of this fact. And instead of saying, for example, this policy will hurt the economy, now I say, I think or I believe or in my opinion, this policy will hurt the economy because that allows me to have discussions with people I disagree with uh, because well, they cannot negate it. How are you going to negate the fact that I believe something? You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's it's really important to have this distinction between what's your opinion and what's an actual reality. The free market of ideas is a wonderful thing, in my opinion, which is why I'm so against censorship in social media and that free market of, let that free market of ideas flow because an idea doesn't hurt anyone, but censoring someone does, that makes them more entrenched in their position, makes them more radical, right? One of the things I learned as an attorney uh, in practice in, in civil litigation is that the best negotiation, the best outcome, is one that no one is happy with. That's the one where you get the most from your adversary that you can while understanding the weaknesses of your own argument. And you may not always get what you want. But if you negotiate and you recognize, okay, so these are the flaws in my case. I can't argue A, B, C, and D because of these facts that are on the record. The other side does the same thing. They do their own self-evaluation. These are the flaws in my arguments. And then you come together and you say, okay, so what is the solution that we can both be comfortable with here? We've lost that in the tribalism that we just talked about earlier. We've lost this idea that compromise is now somehow a bad thing. Compromise is not a bad thing. Compromise is how you get shit done. Do you think an honest politician can actually succeed? Hmm. On what level? On on a local level? Absolutely. I think that there isn't as much attention paid by partisans on a local level. There is no Republican or Democrat or Socialist or Libertarian way to collect the garbage. You just collect the garbage. There is no liberal or democrat or republican or any way to put out a fire there's a base level where i think everybody would agree with that so on a local level yes you can have honest politicians when you get up to let's say congressional you get to congress you get to any state legislature now you're playing gang warfare now it's you know it's my side wearing my colors versus your side wearing your colors and this is where Honest people who get into politics for the right reasons start feeling themselves become compromised because maybe they don't want to work for a certain issue that they don't necessarily agree with. Maybe a social conservative issue like, uh, you know, some issues with health care that you don't want to mess with because you're not necessarily social conservative. But because you're in a coalition with social conservatives, you go along with it, even though you may not personally believe it. That the gang warfare politics, the partisan uh, battle here, is what ends up corrupting people. Because that allows an otherwise honest politician to start compromising on their own personal beliefs that they said that they represent when they were first elected. And they then start have to do what I used to call, what I call in the book, the agenda gymnastics of twisting and contorting your way to get to an end goal rather than sticking to your own personal credibility, your own professional credibility, you end up using that personal capital to say, okay, well, well, this time I'm doing this because, and there's some reasons. So you lose a little bit of personal credibility. But what happens when you use up all of your personal credibility and all you care about is the end goal of your tribal side? That's when a politician 
truly becomes sort of irredeemable in my opinion. And they lose that, that sight of what got them there in the first place. And when you start losing sight of yourself and your own personal credibility, you're definitely going to lose sight of the interests and needs of the people that you represent. So it just becomes this cycle that starts off with a tribal approach to politics, in my opinion. And it's also very difficult to pinpoint when you start losing it. Well, I became conscious of the little white lies that I that I tell throughout the day. You know, I didn't have time. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Whatever the fuck, you know. And but and at first I thought, okay, well, those are little white lies. Yeah, but every time you tell a lie, your consciousness drops a little bit. And sooner or later, you're going to have to make an important decision. And if you've been telling these little whites all along, these little white lies all along, then that's that. Well, that's going to backfire here. You can ask, why are we so sensitive to politicians lying about things that don't matter in a grand scheme of politics? Right. So, for example, what graduate degree they have or their heritage. But then you can also make a case that, well, if they lied all along, then they have a flawed personality and that makes them more susceptible to lie about the policies, the effect and agenda of the policies. What's your take on making it illegal for politicians to lie? Oh, how, how can you do that? You're going to have a thought police out there patrolling everything that people say. It, it's, it's not feasible, but, but you did bring the example you were just talking about is what New Yorkers have been dealing with, with a politician named George Santos. I don't know if you've, heard much about him, but he was a member of Congress who was just recently expelled because of exactly what you were talking about. On the campaign trail, he was lying about his heritage, lying about his education, lying about his personal story, uh, lying about the source of where his money came from. Uh, he ultimately ended up getting charged with uh, federal crimes, including uh, uh, scamming Republicans, his own people, out of money, misrepresenting what his wealth was to the uh, Federal Elections Commission that monitors campaign finance. All these really bad things. And there has been this split within the Republican Party about what to do with him. People like me, who think that buffoons like this shouldn't be allowed to represent people, said that, well, this guy should be expelled, and Congress has the power, with a two-thirds vote, to expel their own membership. That means Republicans would have to get on board with this, along with Democrats, to say, this guy shouldn't be here. He's below the dignity of the office. He's been proven to be a liar. Because it wasn't just, like, allegations. There are There's proof out there. He's admitted to certain lies. And the financial crimes on top of that pending, it's definitely a, a big deal. Uh, but some Republicans were like, there is no truth but power. We only have a four-seat majority in the House of Representatives. We need to hold on to that. So if it means keeping this guy in office, then so be it. And this whole question was confronted within the party about what do we do here? Do we believe that there is no truth but power? Or do we believe that we shouldn't allow people who are conning uh, citizens and taking money from them, allegedly, we shouldn't allow someone under that cloud of uh, suspicion to be in office? Ultimately, all the Democrats said, hey, we'll just kick him out. We don't care because... For them, it was a power game, but half the Republicans in Congress voted to oust him, half didn't. And I've seen that split among people I talk to as well, where I thought it would be a no-brainer. You know, guys, this, this man lied about everything about himself. You didn't, you voted for the image, you didn't vote for the person. Now do you know what the person is? He should be out of office. And everyone outside the district was saying, but we can't lose power. We can't lose that vote. Look at all the trouble we're having now with uh, McCarthy being the speaker and you know now it's you know, Johnson being the speaker and all that. We're going to make it harder for us now. Well, yeah, but you also would lose that district next cycle. 2024 is coming around. You want to hold on to power long term? You're going to have to convince those people in that district that, hey, not all Republicans are George Santos. So by kicking him out now, you're helping the next Republican do that. People were thinking about the short-term games, not the long-term games, in my opinion. Ultimately, half of the party voted with all the Democrats to oust him, and there'll be a special election coming up soon, and then there'll be the general election in November. So there'll be two opportunities to rehabilitate the image of the party in that district because of the damage this person caused. Um, as far as how can you 
regulate speech and you know what should you do with lying politicians, do what you did with George Santos. Sunshine is the greatest disinfectant. Put him out into the spotlight. Put the burning spotlight on these lying politicians. Confront them with their lies. See how they react. And then vote them out. I mean, you can also, I mean, there are other things that you can do as well as far as long term legislation. Uh, certain politicians, and this is prevalent in Europe, you have recall elections. Uh, you can, you can, tr- California has recall elections for just about all their state offices. I know they tried to do it with Gavin Newsom to get him recalled. They successfully recalled a, a, a district attorney in San Francisco and they had a new election then. I think maybe we have to develop a recall mechanism across the country that if you have these scandal-scarred politicians, you have these buffoons out there that are just irredeemable, that lie, cheat, and steal the way that George Santos did, let's have that mechanism there so voters can reassess and reevaluate with new information, saying, oh my God, this guy really lied to us. Let's have a recall process. Let's get enough people to sign a petition saying we want to recall this person. The downside of that is, because politics is so tribal, in close districts, you're always going to have a recall election. So it's a possible solution, but there needs to be this balance between what we can do and what voters should have to live with as far as the consequences of their vote. It's a very tricky balance. Well, there's there's also, I think, two types of lies for politicians. You can, you can say one lies are self-preservation lies so those are meant to just elevate the person and strategic lies or noble lies you could say if you were a little bit extreme so those are the ones that benefit the nation because well one example of a strategic lie that that i can think of right now is what john f kennedy told us about the deal with turkey the americans believe that kennedy managed to convince khrushchev to take these missiles out of Cuba, the, but there was an actual deal that he didn't tell us about. That that in return for the removal of the missiles, the U.S. would not be invading Italy and Turkey. So, and I see this as a noble lie from from F. Kennedy. If you if you have to tell a lie to your people and to European people in order to prevent a crisis, then well, then then fair enough, you know. And those sorts of lies that you're talking about, strategic lies, a lot of it fall into what I was known as puffery that I know of here in, in the laws of the United States. The idea that you're you're selling something rather than lying. Um, there's also another type of lie that I think politicians tell, and that's the lie they tell themselves as well, that they are doing the right thing by doing something bad the justification in their own hearts and minds that, oh, this this is for the greater good, even though it's it's not for the greater good, whether the case may be. And you're going to get tons of examples of those. Those lies that are puffery, that the used car salesman does to really get you to buy that car and all that, those are the lies that I think society can live with. Because those are the lies that people should be able to see through if they put a little effort into it. It's the lies that are much bigger than that, um, that, you know, the, the politician that has this second family in another state, um, those are the lies that we can't deal with. Uh, and believe it or not, that happened in New York as well. New York is full of these sorts of buffoonish politicians. It's absolutely crazy when you look at it. Um, and then it's also the, the, the lies that make you uh, slam your head on a desk uh, that, can't be tolerated as well. There was one politician in New York who was charged with bribery, beat the charges, and then got recorded by an FBI agent soliciting bribes to pay the lawyer who just got him off the bribery charges. True story. Those sorts of lies that are so rid- that are so ridiculous. Those are the ones that are never tolerated as well. The Anthony Weiner lies of, you know, someone hacked into my phone and, and sent that naked picture of me. Those are the ones that can't be tolerated. The ones that strain credulity. And those are the ones that get people in trouble more often than not. But it's also not the lie that gets people in trouble. It's the lie after the lie. The cover-up of the lie that really sinks politicians. 
And you can think of every politician out there. It's not so much you know, many of the scandal scarred ones. It's not the the act, the bad act that happened. We talk about lies, but there's also bad acts that happen as well. It's not the bad act that will get someone in trouble. It's the cover up of the bad act, the lying about the bad act, that really sinks them. Uh, so there, there's that component of it as well. And it all comes down to for everyone, whether you're a politician, citizen. Whatever. It all comes down to this idea of holding yourself accountable. Having your own personal responsibility to act right in office or to put in the work to learn about the people in office that are representing you. If everyone took personal responsibility over themselves, we wouldn't have nearly as many problems with politicians as we do today. I I think it, it would be fair to kind of lower the bar for politicians and just have... um just vote them out in case they lie deliberately and not having them well and not expecting them to tell the truth because what do you know what the truth is you know i mean it's important to mention that it's almost impossible to define the truth in order for for politicians to tell the truth they would have to dissect everything they say and dive deep into each sentence to eliminate any subjective perspectives they have right because that's their own reality uh, there's actually a very good exercise, by the way, that I think even the audience can practice on a daily basis. Um, it Well, it helps you see how much of what you believe is true. It's actually just a figment of your imagination. And our imagination, because we're very intelligent beings, is, is rampant. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I park at a parking spot. A stranger passes by as I'm leaving the parking spot and they tell me, hey, you shouldn't park here. Okay, now from this moment on, the possibilities for my imagination are wide open and the story I derive from this event can be a total fantasy. Okay, let's take my stepdad, for example. Okay, let's take him. He's Bosnian. He's living in Slovenia, so he's a little bit self-conscious about the fact that he's Bosnian because we know Slovenians don't like immigrants. So what he can derive from this event, which is a simple event, is, first of all, the person told me that I couldn't park here. The person doesn't like me, okay? The person is hostile towards me. He doesn't like me because I'm Bosnian. He's discriminating and he insulted me because I'm a Bosnian. Now, only a fraction of that is facts. The rest is a story that aligns with his beliefs about the society and the world, okay? And now we do that on a daily basis, mostly subconsciously, a fraction of that is conscious. And I think just revealing this is a good exercise. A good exercise is, I would call it story dissecting. So throughout your day, you can choose events. If they include strangers, that's even better because that gives your imagination uh, more doors to open, right? And you can dissect these stories by eliminating things that you cannot prove to yourself to be facts. And I think you can do it well, not every day, that's for sure, because your life is going to become too chaotic because you need a story and you need a belief. And I, I, I'm not sure if I'm stepping the line, but I think that you can also take this to a level of marginalized groups as well. So how much of claim discrimination is deliberate insults and how much is their perception of what happened, which is impacted by their reality? Um you know, one thing I've learned, one thing I've learned in working in real estate for the last couple of months is that everyone has their own little reality. My reality is not your reality. So, so it's, 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 so it's almost impossible to tell the truth, but you can make an effort to not tell deliberate lies. Try being a lawyer one day and dealing with clients and you really see about personal narratives and things like that. My goodness. Previous experiences are a barrier to truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Experience is one of the barriers to innovation, right? Because if you're experienced, you do the same thing over and over again, and you become comfortable in doing that over and over again. Uh, and you, you lose sight of any other possibilities that may be better than what you've done over and over again. In the law, before I started practicing, everyone was in a library working with books and going from, you know, one uh, book that would help you find what they call a key site to another book finding the case to another book checking that case to see if it's still good law. Now we, you know, for decades now we've had computers, but I still know attorneys who go to the stacks, who go to the books, because even though it's more efficient 
to have it all on one your computer and type in some key phrases and do your Boolean search and all those things that you can do, they still go to the books because that's what they're comfortable with. That's their experience. And they're very expert attorneys, but they'll go to the stacks. That's kind of what I'm talking about here, how experience can be a barrier to truth. And, and in the same way that government does things over and over again the same way, and that's the way that we're comfortable with, but if there's a better innovation out there, it's going to take years before government becomes comfortable with it to actually adopt it into their policy. I would go one step further and say that known territory is enslavement. And you can, you know, and you can take your traumas and things that you're dealing with personally and you can voluntarily have other people. Well, you can voluntarily enslave yourself to other people because let's say someone says something to me and I'm the only one who can make myself mad, okay? That that person didn't make me mad. They did something. I made myself mad, right? This is the I mean, the, this is the reason why the trauma is not what someone does, but how you react to it. So, and I think that if someone has the power to make you mad, that's the worst type of slavery. So, slavery is not that. So, you know, so experiences as barriers to truth and also known territory as a form of enslavement. Um, but well, also, we also have different definition of lies, even, I think, which is, I mean, which is almost impressive because for you, a lie might be deliberately deceiving only. So you might tell me that you're planning to have a meeting with a client tomorrow when you actually doubt they will show up. However, if they happen to call you back, then the meeting will happen. So, hey, you are planning to have a meeting, right? So it's a, it's a lie in a tuxedo. It's a lie in a suit. It might not be a straight direct lie, but it's deceiving nevertheless. So one must not lie, but the truth can be delivered in creative ways. You might say that. And that's like, to, to me, I mean, you know, to me, that's a lie in a suit. I would, to me, that's not really a lie as it is. My intention was always to have the meeting. I'm ready to have the meeting. It takes two to have a meeting. So if the meeting doesn't go off or not, the outcome does not dictate the veracity of the previous statement in that respect. I think that when we talk about what a lie is, it comes down to the intention of the statement. That's the biggest thing. So when someone goes out there and says, well, I, I have a meeting scheduled with so-and-so at 2 o'clock and... We're going to be talking about X, Y, and Z. If so-and-so doesn't show up, I'm not lying that I had a meeting. It just, my reality is now, I had a meeting, but it didn't happen. So that's not a lie. It's, it's, it's your statement of intention beforehand. Yeah, I agree. It's all about the intention. Because, because you can also say, you can also say, well, your intention can be, telling me you have a meeting in order for me to believe that you have a meeting in order for me to believe that let's say you are important for example while no while you know that this meeting will probably not happen as opposed to you telling me i plan on having a meeting because you know you plan on having a meeting because you want me to know that you are planning for it right it, it, it's not deceiving it's not manipulation you're not trying to achieve any goal you just want me to know that you are planning to have a meeting. Maybe you even add, but they may not show up because we haven't decided on having the meeting and, and the exact hour and they haven't confirmed it, right? But the first case scenario, I would say, is a line of tuxedo because you want me to believe that the meeting is going to happen. There's also the concept of plausible deniability. The idea of you insulate yourself with staff, let's say. You have a scheduler, you have a secretary assistant, you have a chief of staff in your office, something, things like that. You put barriers between the direct line of communication. The secretary, the receptionist answers the phone, they put you on hold. You go to a staffer who deals with that issue. They set up whatever conversation they want to have. Or if it's more personal, you're at a meeting in the community. And people want to talk to you, but your staff is around you saying, no, no, we can't talk right now. We got to take him over here or we got to take her over here, whatever the case may be. 
and you know we we can't stay and talk and and maybe you could have maybe you even wanted to but your staff took that initiative to insulate around you and maybe the staff is saying a little white lie about where you're going as well it's so many different layers out there that we can talk about that and and the thing about it is that you'll never get a hard and fast rule about how to deal with it you have to have the tools to deal with it in every situation which is why I go back to my idea of natural curiosity because that will allow you to adapt in evaluating the given situation. Well, there's also something to be said about your uh, delusion of reality as you climb up the hierarchy. So let's say you enter politics at the beginning. You are, well, you you don't have that many people who respect you or who are afraid of you. So you're probably going to have some people in your corner who are going to give you constructive criticism. So you deliver a speech and the person who's on your side, they say, hey, you know, you are you sure you are are you sure you really think that? Are you sure you're right about that? Right? So you have some you have some ground and, and you, you are in contact with reality, but then as you are climbing the political hierarchy, there's gonna be less and less of these people because well, because people are afraid, because now you have more and more power. So even what the other people will tell you will be more or less an echo chamber. Right. And we see Stalin as an extreme example of that. For example, I think Putin as well. People are afraid of you. So I think the way to keep yourself grounded is by talking to other people because, well, they have information you don't have. You know, when you when your own opinion is the only thing you have, then you're not very realistic. And that's also yeah, it's it's also something to be said about that. I think it's very beneficial as, well, not just as a president, but as any type of person who thinks they will be at a high position at some point to keep someone on your side and just, just tell them, look, whatever happens, whoever I become, whatever power I have, it's your job to keep me grounded. <laughs> now, you may want to have three people like that because, you know, be, because they're susceptible to that as well. But I think that's, yeah, that's one of the things, you know, a lot of these people are, I, I think, I think Trump is, I mean, has that situation a little bit, you know, he's a, maybe a narcissistic to a degree and everything he hears is like, I mean, his opinion is like throwing stuff in a mirror. It's people tell you what you want them to tell you. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's useless. It's also a great compliment. It's a, it's an honor to have someone who expects something from you and who who tells you who disagrees with you and criticizes you because it's expectation you cannot expect something from someone if you believe they're incapable of it so to speak so the higher the bar they have the more they criticize you the higher well the the bigger their expectations for you because i have my grandmother for example she expects nothing from me because she thinks i'm perfect and to me this is this is it's well it it it's it's a tragedy in a way because I need you to tell me when I'm wrong and I need you to expect more of me. Actually, I want you to because to me that's respect. And do you think that? Well, do you think that most of us, if we were capable of having absolute power, would become? Um, not necessarily w would become excited Assholes. about having the yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think that to some degree if we don't have that external check yeah we all become assholes with with that i mean we the, the phrase drunk with power is around for a reason yeah well you have to be rational about it because you can ask yourself if i was to become a leader of a country which system would i prefer the system where i have the ultimate power where i'm the one who decides on everything or the system where there's checks and balances. So a system where there's institutions which I have to, um, by which laws I have to abide and limit myself. And that, that, that takes humility and rationality because you, I mean, I don't know, like at first glance, well, fuck it. I would want all the power. I, I trust myself enough to do the best for the nation. Right? So, uh, all the power. I'm not corrupted. Give me all the power. Fuck it, you know? I don't need no institutions. Well, I mean, I, I would vote for you, too. But, um... So, what, what I would do... I mean, the, the thing of it all is... Nobody has all the answers. But it takes someone with a little bit of humility to say that. 
It doesn't take a lot of humility to say that. Um, it takes a little bit of humility. By the time you get to the point of ultimate power, let's say, I would think that there would be intermittent steps along the way of little power, gaining power, gaining power, gaining power. And unless you keep that humility from when you got that first taste of that, you know, little commissioner job that you had in your town to when you get to supreme rule of the world. Where can people find you? Okay, so the best way to find me is uh, I have a YouTube channel called Buffoon of the Week. You can check me out there. I put up videos Monday through Thursdays at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so you can check me out there. I am on uh, Twitter, or actually whatever you want to call it, at G Berardelli. It's G-B-E-R-A-R-D-E-L-L-I. And you can also find my book, Schnooks, Crooks, Lies, and Scoundrels, A Field Guide to Identifying Political Buffoons, at book.buffoonoftheweek.com. Go buy it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all fine bookstores. Check it out. I put a lot of my heart and soul into this. It's a lot of fun. I think it's a fun read. And I hope you check it out. And thank you so much for this conversation. This has been tremendous. I love stuff like this. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. I can't say that, but I do know this. Up, up.